The Emilent MS-18 has been advertised as the world's brightest flashlight. It produces 100,000 lumens. A lumen is a measurement of light and also heat. Just for comparison purposes, a 60-watt bulb in your home produces about 800 lumens. This flashlight produces 100,000. A 2300 lumen bulb can burn paper if the paper is just brought near enough to that source. doesn't have to touch it, just be brought near enough. This flashlight produces 44 times that amount of light and heat. It is amazing. However, a group of young science enthusiasts has built a flashlight even more powerful than that one. Theirs produces a whopping 1.4 million lumens. In their test, their flashlight exploded a radiometer which measures lumen output. Here's a video clip of the comparison of those two flashlights. This is the Imolent MS-18, the world's brightest flashlight that you can buy. And this is our flashlight. All right, world's brightest flashlight. Let's see what happens. Woo! Uh oh. Oh! Spinning. Oh, oh man. <laughs> it's spinning real fast. <laughs> Let's try our flashlight. Boy, oh, you can't, you can't see anything. <laughs> All right, we've only got seven seconds before this baby overheats. Let's do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Woo! Look how fast this is. Oh. Wow. <laughs> that flashlight can illuminate an entire football field by itself. An entire football field lit up by one flashlight. I want that flashlight. <laughs> As a boy, my main use of using a flashlight was for hunting night crawlers. My brother and I loved to fish, and so we would hunt night crawlers regularly. You had to have quick reflexes for that because as soon as the light from a dim flashlight shines on that worm, it would head immediately into its hole, and you had to snatch it up quickly before it got away. Not with this flashlight. As soon as those 1.4 million lumens hit that worm, it would never move again. <laughs> you could reach down at your laser and pick up your worm extra crispy. <laughs> Think of the applications of a light that bright. You could signal the inhabitants of a distant planet with that flashlight. You, with that flashlight, you would win at flashlight tag every time. You would have to frequently replace your friends, but hey, victory comes at a price, right? <laughs> Don't want to spend three days tanning at the bush, bush or at the beach, that is? Turn on this flashlight, and in three seconds, you'll be nicely toasted. Is your neighbor's pesky drone hovering over your house again? Zap that thing out of the sky with one shot of that flashlight. Do bullfrogs jump away before you can gig them? Not with this flashlight. It spots them and fries them at the same time. <laughs> A good light has great value. Light illuminates things for us. We need that. The Apostle Peter encouraged us to use good lighting to illuminate our minds and our hearts and to guide us through the spiritual darkness of this world. That light that he referred to is the Word of God. Let's read what Peter wrote about that subject in 2 Peter 1, 19-21. We have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human spoke from God 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter tells us that we live in dark times. Spiritual darkness has invaded our world. You might have noticed in that scripture we just read how Peter described the Bible. He called it a light shining in a dark place. Jesus also, on a few occasions, referred to this world as being in darkness. The apostle Paul did as well. He called this world the domain of darkness. He stated in 2 Corinthians 4 that Satan has blinded minds so that some people cannot see the light. Last week, I had a discussion with a young man who was raised as a Christian, but he hasn't attended church in over a decade. He doesn't serve God in any visible way. He doesn't support God's work or his church. He is living in an immoral relationship. He waved off my concerns that I expressed for him by telling me that he feels closer to God now than he ever has. I fear he has been blinded. I fear that he is so lost that he doesn't recognize the truth any longer. He has adopted the spiritual philosophy of this world which says you don't need the church and you don't need to obey obey some biblical instruction for you to be in the right relationship with God. That is the philosophy of a darkened world. Our young people are being raised in a society that no longer recognizes the Bible as authoritative. The Bible is referred to as antiquated and out of touch. Our children are being taught to formulate morality by a different standard, by whatever feels right to them, as long as it doesn't cross any accepted cultural norms. They are taught a darkened form of morality and cannot discern God's light. Satan has brought that darkness into our world. He's done so slowly over time in order for it to be accepted. For example, let's take a look at the development of television morality. In the late, or in the, uh, Early 1960s, television programs showed husbands and wives sleeping in separate beds in order to preserve public propriety. Within a handful of years, however, bedroom scenes showed husbands and wives sleeping together because that's typically what husbands and wives do. And then some years after that, cutting-edge programs introduced non-married couples in bed together. But they did so in such a way that it was portrayed as romantic and beautiful, and the viewers almost wanted them to sleep together. And then several years after that, more progressive programs broke through moral walls and put gay couples in the same bed on our television screens. And by that time, the U.S. population was ready to accept it. Because that darkness had crept into our lives slowly. Had non-married or gay couples been portrayed in bed together in the 1960s, the general population would have howled in protest. But it crept in slowly. When Corporal Klinger put on a dress in 1978, we laughed because... It was a ridiculous notion, and we understood the humor. When Bruce Jenner put on a dress in 2015, no one laughed. He had become the face of a transgender movement that was so widely accepted that that year he was named ESPN Person of the Year. And later that year, he received the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize for courage. That's an even more ridiculous notion than Corporal Klinger. And it's an indication of how deeply into darkness our nation has slid. How could we have come to that dark point? 
It happened in baby steps. And no one saw it coming. Those steps can be identified, the deterioration of morals. The first step in that process is desensitization. That means that we hear or see something so often that it no longer shocks us. The second step in the deterioration of morals is tolerance. We put up with it without accepting that moral as our own standard. The third step in the deterioration of morals is indifference. We get tired of being righteously indignant about this new moral thing. And so we just, we don't even want to think about it anymore. We try to put it out of our mind. The final step in the deterioration of morals is acceptance. What once was immoral now comes to mind or to our lips far too easily. Because it has slowly become a part of the way that we think or the way that we act or the way that we speak. Darkened spiritual understanding has crept into our world one baby step at a time so that we would not be able to discern it. If it came rushing at us at a fast pace, we would have seen that and reacted but it has slowly and imperceptibly invaded our culture and our thinking, and it has changed our world's morals. It's the law of four dogs at work. Are you familiar with the law of four dogs? Probably not, because I made it up myself. (laughs) Here's how it works. You get a new puppy and you teach it to sleep in its own kennel beside your bed. You close the kennel door before you go to sleep at night because after all, it's a new puppy and you don't want it wandering around your house at night because it isn't housebroken. After a few months, your puppy becomes trustworthy. So you no longer close the kennel door before you go to sleep at night. One morning, the puppy jumps into your bed to greet you. You enjoy the cuddle time, and so you let it stay there until you decide to get up. And then in the middle of the next night, the puppy decides that your bed is more comfortable than his kennel. You see where this is leading, don't you? And so he jumps into bed with you, but it's the middle of the night, and you're sleepy, and you're too tired to kick him out, so you let him stay for one night. However, he now considers it his bed. And he starts the next night there. You put him into his kennel, but he whines. You try to quiet him, but he continues to whine. After several minutes of his whining, you give up and you let him sleep with you. And now it is his bed. So keep count with me. You now have one dog in your bed. A few months later, you decide that your puppy needs a playmate. So you get a second one. You now have how many? Two dogs in your bed. Then you find a stray puppy wandering around your street. You go door to door, but no one claims him. You put posters up all over town, but no one calls. By this time, you have bonded with that puppy. And so you now have how many? Three dogs sharing your bed. Months later, you're driving and you see an abandoned puppy sitting beside a very busy street and she looks frightened your heart goes out to her you open your car door and she jumps in you can't imagine the thought of what might happen to her if you take her to the pound so guess what you now have how many four dogs sleeping in your bed now you might think that that is just some ridiculous hypothetical situation i have concocted But one of our sons and his wife have four dogs sleeping in their bed, two pit bulls, one Australian shepherd, and one German shepherd mix. Occasionally, a toddler who had a bad dream or a nursing infant is added to that menagerie for the night. Our son has trouble sleeping. Imagine that. This is really a metaphor of our times. We have let the darkness creep in little by little. 
And now our world has gone to the dogs. Ironically, those who oppose living by God's word tell us that we have now become an enlightened society and we no longer need the ancient ancient superstitions of dark ages. But it is the unchristian who are darkened in their understanding, according to Peter. Isaiah 5.20 issues us this warning. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. We are living in dark times. But we are guided by a great light, and that great light is God's word. His word, Peter told us in verses 20 and 21, has been inspired by the Holy Spirit. No prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In this passage, Peter explains to us the origin of Scripture. Scripture did not come from man. It came as the Holy Spirit inspired various people to write. And so, therefore, the Bible is the very words, the very thoughts of God. And it will light our way. It will provide illumination for us. It will guide us through our life. God is the source of light in our world. He who created light to illuminate in our world by speaking it into existence in the beginning is the same God who provides spiritual light for us to illuminate our life in this dark world. And that spiritual light is the Bible. Scriptures confirm that role that they play in our lives. We read this in Psalm 19.8. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Proverbs 6.23 tells us the law of the Lord is a lamp and its teachings shine brightly. And most of us are familiar with Psalm 119 and 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. The Bible is our moral compass. It guides us through a sin-darkened world. It is an illuminating force given to us. We saw that in verse 19, didn't we? Let's read it again. You will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We're going to leave that verse up for just a couple of minutes. I want to dissect it a little bit. In this verse, Peter describes our enlightenment. He uses that phrase, the the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We will have our own times of illumination and enlightenment. And the context tells us that those times come to us when we pay attention to it, when we pay attention to God's word, when we study God's word. And so we can be enlightened individually by reading God's will for us recorded in the pages of the Holy Bible. There's a story in the life of Jesus that illustrated this point. It was a story of Jesus and his disciples being invited into the homes, a uh, home of two sisters named Mary and Martha. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus listening to him teach while Martha busied herself with kitchen preparations. She didn't like it that her sister Mary was not helping her, and so she complained to Jesus about that. Lord, she said, Mary has left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her to help me. Jesus said, Martha, you are worried about many things, but only one is needed. Mary has chosen that which is better. The point that Jesus made is that there are many distractions in our world, but the most important thing that we can do is to learn from him, to study, to read his 
scriptures to learn God's will for our life. And so let's take every opportunity to study this book. It will enlighten us and guide us through this sin-darkened world. Isaiah 9 is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. It tells us that part of his mission is to save people from the dark forces and the dark philosophies of this world. We read that in verse 2 of that chapter when it says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Jesus came to usher in an age of enlightenment, and God's word is that source of enlightenment. There we learn of the Messiah. There we find the path of salvation. There we learn of God's will for our lives. I want you to be enlightened, to learn, to be guided safely through the mess of a maze that exists in this world. The Apostle Paul wrote words of instruction just like that to the Ephesian Christians They are also words of instruction to us. They're found in Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 21. Stop living like godless people. Their minds are in the dark. And they are stubborn and ignorant and have missed out on the life that comes from God. They are no longer sensitive to what is right. And they do all kinds of indecent things. But this isn't what you were taught about Jesus Christ. He is the truth. And you learn about him. And that's our key to enlightenment, learning about him, being taught in the truth. I want you to be taught the truth of God's word. I want you to learn about Jesus, about his life, and about his teachings, and about his purpose for your life. And so for that reason, our leaders are introducing Sunday morning Bible studies beginning in September. We are adding to our current Sunday school format a high school class and two adult classes that would be Bible studies where we can find the enlightenment of God and find our way through this sin-darkened world. So this morning I'm encouraging you to sign up for one of those classes. There's a table in the foyer with a couple of sign-up sheets for the adult classes, one for younger adults and one for older adults. Somebody said I should have put mature adults. Okay, so it's younger adults and mature adults and more mature adults. Let's put it that way. You determine where the cutoff age is. We don't care which class you go to. We just want you to be enlightened. We want you to learn. We want you to be who God created you to be. And studying from his word is the source of that education. And so we're offering it to you. And we hope that you will accept that challenge. That you will join one of those classes. God will bless your life. The more time you spend in the scriptures. God will bless our church. The more biblically, biblically knowledgeable we become. God wants us to be enlightened. And he offers this opportunity for us. I challenge you to take it.